Pope Francis recently issued an apostolic exhortation called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. I don't think there's any coincidence to the fact that he issued this exhortation, this official document addressed to bishops, to clergy, to religious, and to the lay faithful, so pretty much everybody in the church, and he issued it right before Advent. Advent, of course, is a season of joyful anticipation. It's a season where we joyfully anticipate the second coming of Christ, even as we await his birth or the celebration of his birth at Christmas. And so this season's a season marked with joy. So I don't think there's any coincidence that the Holy Father issued this document about the joy of the gospel as we enter into the Advent season. You know, it's kind of coincidental, too, that Advent marks the beginning of a church year. So not only is it a season filled with joy, but it's the beginning of a church year. In our new years in the secular culture, we often make resolutions of what we're going to do to change and improve our lives. I think perhaps this Um, exhortation issued by Pope Francis could be a type of New Year's resolution for many Catholics for the church as a whole. Pope Francis wrote, um, it's a lengthy document, I I don't have time to summarize it all in one YouTube video, but I want to summarize a a small piece of this document. And that's basically that the joy of the gospel that we receive as, as Catholics, as Christians, is something that we need to share with all people. The Pope tells us that this means that we need to become evangelists. See, if we receive joy, joy by its very nature is meant to be shared. You know, I think I'm a Notre Dame football fan and Notre Dame fan in all sports, but football certainly, as many people probably notice, I've got the Notre Dame logo behind me. As a Notre Dame fan, when Notre Dame wins a big game, which unfortunately doesn't happen as often as I'd like, but when they do... I get excited about that. I call up my friends and my family, and I don't just tell them that Notre Dame won the game. No, I go and I tell them every single play in the game. You know, I recap every great catch or tackle or scoring drive or something like that. That's because I'm so excited and filled with joy that Notre Dame won. Now, if I feel this way about something as trivial as a football game, how much more should I feel about an encounter with the living God, the God who is love itself, a God who loves me to infinity. Of course I should want to share that if I receive that. And the Pope says that this is what all of us should do. Whenever we encounter Christ, who is God, who is love, we should be filled with joy. And this joy should move us. It should cause us to want to go out to the world and to create disciples so that they too can experience the same joy that we experience. The Pope also said something I think that was very telling. He talks about the way in which, as we form disciples, as we go out to preach this gospel, our first role as evangelists is to evangelize those who are not believers. I thought that was a wonderful line. It was very comforting to me, I think, in terms of this own internet ministry that I've started. I know many people who listen to these videos are, in fact, Catholics. But there's also a few people who listen to them who are not believers. And when they first started being the primary people who were responding to the videos all the time, I was wondering, you know, what is the mission that I have here in terms of this internet ministry that I've set up with Working to Beat Hell? And I feel very affirmed now hearing the the Pope's words saying to go out and evangelize, and primarily we need to reach those who aren't in our churches, who aren't in our midst. And so I'm glad for the dialogue that I'm able to have with people who maybe aren't believers. And I find it very uh, profitable. And I think that, if nothing else, they certainly see that I have a great joy that comes from my faith. And that's really what I want for them. I, I want them to have that same sense of joy that I have, which is why I do hope someday they will all come to the Lord, that they will all come to know God, come to know Christ. And I don't mean to to minimize our, our differences or anything like that, but I do think that if I can share that joy with them, at least they can see the church in a positive light, and perhaps it will open them to the gospel. Perhaps God will reveal himself to them through this ministry that I do online. Now, one of the things that's important for us to understand when we talk about joy, though, is that joy doesn't mean that we're always in a state of of bliss. Um, That's certainly not the case. Um, But joy is something that's a little deeper, a little more profound. You see, one of the dangers that the Pope notes is that so often in our world, rather than seeking joy, we seek pleasure. And let me describe the the difference. Pleasures are these things that provide us kind of an instant gratification, but fail to truly satisfy the deepest longings of our being. 
I find this to be very dangerous when we start to seek pleasure instead of joy. Because what happens often is we put ourselves in positions where we allow ourselves to be manipulated. You see, true joy comes from knowing that I am loved and desired by the one whom I love and desire. You know, so often people hear Jesus loves you, God loves you, but they don't integrate that into their lives. Instead, they just hear it kind of as words that have almost become a, a slogan without any kind of meaning behind it. And the danger with that is that if I don't truly understand that God loves me infinitely, that I am infinitely loved by God, and not only that, but God is the longing of my heart, so I am loved by the one whom I long for, what's going to happen is I'm going to try to seek love elsewhere. So if I don't understand that I am loved by the one whom I love, whom I desire, I'm going to try to seek love and approval elsewhere. And that that's where we become manipulated. You see, the minute that we strive to seek approval elsewhere, to prove that we are lovable, to prove that we are worthy, that we have an inherent dignity, we allow other people to manipulate us. Because somebody could say, you know, Father Brian, I, I love you so long as you do this for me, or so long as you keep your homilies and YouTube videos short, or something like that. Um, and we can bring this, obviously, to, to more important degrees, as long as you wear these types of clothes, act this way, have these types of things. And to the extent that we do that, suddenly we allow people to manipulate ourselves, because we've placed our self-worth not in our own being, in our own dignity, but in these external things, in either accomplishments or or wealth, or power, or status, or pleasure. And we seek those things thinking that's what's going to fulfill us and make us happy and make us lovable. And all we really need to do is to understand that we don't have to do anything to prove that we're lovable. God loves us infinitely. And he doesn't love us because we've done something, or we've accomplished something, or that we have something. He loves us for who we are. We are made in his image and likeness. And if we truly understand that, that should provide us with a profound sense of joy to the extent that we can then enter into true relationships with other people. Uh, because now my relationships aren't based on manipulation. They're based on authentic love for one another. Because no longer am I worried about whether somebody's going to like me because I have the right things or say the right things or act the right way. Instead, I can enter into a relationship where I say, I am confident in who I am, I'm loved by the one whom I love, and I can share that with other people in an authentic way rather than a manipulative way. And that's a very powerful thing to do, is to be able to share that in a way where you're not manipulated. You know, the Pope in his document talks about the way in which the disciples faced a lot of torture, and yet they came out of that rejoicing, as it said. Now, this isn't because they were gluttons for punishment or because they were insane or anything like that. No, what had happened is the disciples took such joy in their relationship with Christ that it grounded everything that, about them. It grounded the entirety of their being such that the world could throw its worst at them and could torture them and even sentence them to death. And... It, nothing that they threw at them, nothing that the world threw at them could take that joy away. The fact that they faced death didn't at all stop them from rejoicing in their relationship with Christ. See, that's the power of having joy. That's the power of the gospel, is knowing that I am, in fact, loved infinitely. And when I have that knowledge, it frees me, it liberates me to now be my truest self, be the, the fullest form of myself that I can be. And that's really what the Pope wants us to focus on. I think that was uh, a huge point in his apostolic exhortation. Not the only one, certainly, but, but a huge point in it. And I think it's also something that's worthy of reflection during Advent, as this is a season of joyful anticipation. We anticipate the second coming of Christ, but we do so as people who are joy-filled. We don't do so in fear. We don't do so uh, worried that we might not be um, all that we can be, but rather we know that we are loved by God, and that gives us a profound grounding, a profound sense of joy, and we can then go forth and be evangelists and share that joy that we have with others so that they too can experience that profound sense of joy that we have as Catholic Christians.